Greetings, Java students. I'm a little bit sick um, today, but I thought I'd like to record a video that walks you through what we did in class the other day. In class, we made a ball fountain, which creates ball objects and shoots them upwards whenever you click the mouse. So we'll start off with that, and then in the video that I'll record afterwards, um, we'll tinker around a bit with the concepts involved and see if we can leverage that code to do other interesting things. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. So. This is the already written one. Let's start from the beginning as if uh, we don't already have it. So let's create a new Java project. Um, I will call this one test fountain because I already made my fountain project. And I'll close this stuff. Uh, let's start by creating our processing kind of main file first. So I'll call this one fountain. I don't want a main method. And just like the other processing programs that we'd made before, we want to say extends papplet, which means that our class is going to be a type of papplet, which is a type of graphics window. Um, it doesn't know what papplet is, so I've got to put core.jar in the build path. So you can select your project here on the left, right click, go all the way down to properties, select Java build path here on the left, select the libraries tab, and say add external jars, and if you're lucky, you'll see core staring you in the face, and if you are not lucky, you have to go find where is your core.jar. Um, you only have it if you downloaded processing, but if you did, uh, I unzipped my processing download inside the C drive, so I'd go to C drive, and then find a processing folder, and then inside here, probably the fastest thing to do is to just search for core.jar, and you'll find it. Um, all right, so now I can import papplet, and we're good to go. Again, this is review, but uh, papplet has two major methods. Setup, which runs once when you first run the program. It's for setting everything up, and the first thing you need to set up is the size of the window, so that's a 600 by 600 window. The second thing is draw. This runs in a continuous loop, and so draw is responsible for drawing every single frame of the program as it runs. So let's start by creating a simple bouncing ball object and that, that doesn't use any objects at all, actually. We'll just make a bouncing ball with variables. Um, but then we'll copy and paste the relevant portions into a ball class, which will let us create ball objects, um, which will let us have hundreds and hundreds of them very easily. All right, so let's see, a ball. What variables describe a ball? Well, I think I'll need an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate for where is the center of the ball. And I'll need an x speed and a y speed for its uh, its horizontal and vertical motion. And I'll want a diameter. I'm using float here. Float is a primitive data type, sort of like double, uh, except it's less precise. But it's the data type that processing uses, which is why we are using it. Um, I guess the last thing is I'll make uh, I'll make an int variable called ball color for the ball's color. All right, so setup. This is where we want to assign values to all of these variables. So I'll start x and y at 300 and 100. Um, the screen, as you recall, is 600 by 600. So this is sort of in the middle of the screen, down a little bit. I'll make the diameter be 30. Um, I'll keep x speed and y speed 0. They're actually already 0, but doesn't hurt to be explicit. Um, ball color. We're going to create a color using processes, processing's built-in color command. So you give it three numbers, a certain amount of red, a certain amount of blue, and a certain amount of green. So this color is a lot of red and a little bit of blue and a little bit more green, but still not very much. All right, so this describes all of the facts about the ball object. So that's all set up. Inside draw, we actually want to use those facts to draw an ellipse right where we think the ball should be. The first thing we want to do is draw a background. Uh, 255 should be white. The ellipse command draws an ellipse, and you tell it the xy location where you want the ellipse to be centered. And if I use xy, those are the exact variables I'm using for the center of where my ball is supposed to be. And I'm going to use diameter and diameter for the width and the height of the ellipse. So in other words, I'm saying draw an ellipse right where the ball should be centered using the variables that have the diameter of the ball. 
Um, so that should take care of drawing it. And if I run it, you should see there's my ball. Oh, it's not colored yet. Let's uh, let's color it. So the fill command um, will sort of load the new paint color that it uses whenever you have a drawing command afterwards. So I will fill it with ball color. And now when we run it, there's my ball. Okay. It's not moving yet though. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say x equals x plus x speed. Um, because if you remember from before, speed is a change in position. So if my speed is 2, I'm saying take my x coordinate and add 2 to it and store that as my new x coordinate. So that's going to make me move horizontally. Same thing for y, y equals y plus y speed. Um, and if I give these some speeds, like 1 and 3, you can see when I run it that it is now moving. <coughs> um, I want to add, I'm going to change these back to 0. I want to add gravity. Gravity is a force that accelerates us downwards. And if you think about what acceleration is, acceleration is something that changes our speed over time. If our speed were constant, we're not accelerating. So if we have an acceleration downwards, that must be changing our vertical speed to be going faster and faster downwards as time elapses. So I'll say y speed equals y speed plus 0.1f. OK. Um, first of all, you might be thinking, if I'm trying to go faster downwards, why am I adding a number? Because down seems like it should be subtracting. Um, I just want to remind you how processing works. 0, 0 is in the upper left-hand corner. So as you go down, the y coordinates are actually going up until the y coordinate down here is at 600. So that's why I'm adding to my y speed. Um, the f means float. If I left this off, it would think the 0 0.1 was a double. And we could cast it to float this way. Um, but that seems more awkward to me than just including the f here, which uh, makes that be a float. All right, so now I've got uh, gravitational acceleration downwards. Cool. Uh, I think I want it to bounce off the bottom of the screen. So in order to do that, I'll need to test to see, is it hitting the bottom of the screen? I could do that this way. I could say, if the y coordinate is larger than 600, because that's where the bottom of the screen is, then I want the y speed to be the opposite of the, what, what the y speed currently is. So if the y speed was uh, positive, uh, going downwards, which means it's a positive number, as soon as it hits the bottom of the screen, it'll become negative, which will make it go up again. Cool. Uh, the problem with this is you'll notice that it looks like the bottom of the ball gets cut off there when it hits the bottom of the screen because the y coordinate is actually the center of the ball. But I want to test if the bottom of the ball is hitting the bottom of the screen. So the bottom of the ball is the y coordinate of the center plus half of the diameter. So I'll say diameter over 2. So now I'm saying start at the center of the ball. I'm going to add the coordinate that is the radius of the ball. So I'm sort of going downwards until I get to the bottom. So all of this together is the y coordinate of the bottom of the ball. So if that is larger than 600, it must mean that the bottom is hitting the bottom of the screen. And that's when I want it to bounce. Cool. So that's looking pretty good. All right. Um, so that is a single bouncing ball object. What I want to do now is I want to rewrite this so that if I want 100 ball objects, I don't need to create all of these variables every single time. What I want to do instead is something like this. I want to be able to say, give me a ball object called ball. And then inside here, instead of uh, assigning all of the numbers one at a time, I can say my ball should be created with a constructor where it starts at 300, 100 and its diameter is 30, and it starts off with an x speed and a y speed of 0. Um, I'm going to set the colors separately, so I'm not going to have colors be set in the constructor here. Um, you can see how this is all a lot cleaner. Um, this is much shorter than declaring, what is this, seven variables, six variables. Um, this is a lot shorter than assigning to six variables. So that's the goal. Um, let's do it. I'll right click on Test Fountain. And I'll create a new class called ball with a capital B. Finish. So if you remember from before, uh, the fields 
are the first thing in your class. Fields are variables that describe your object. The next thing is the constructor, which is the method that allows you to construct the object. And after that will go, will come methods that give behaviors to our object. So um, I'm more or less just going to copy and paste what I have over here because I know this code already describes the ball object I want to have. So I'm going to cut all these and I'm going to paste them as the fields of my ball object. And the constructor, um, what makes a constructor distinctive is it's got to have the same name as the class, so it's called ball. It does not have any return type, not even void. And uh, I got to decide, let's see, I think I want it to take five numbers as inputs, representing the x and the y and the uh, diameter and the x speed and the y speed. So I'll just create some inputs. So x and y and diameter and x speed and y speed. And then I want to assign each of these inputs to one of the fields. So when this constructor gets run, the 300 gets copied into this x input variable. And I want to take the 300 stored in this x and store it into the field x up here. Well, I can't say x equals x because when I say x, it doesn't know is it talking about this input variable or is it talking about that field of the object up here. So if I say this dot x, the keyword this uh, means that we're referring to the field of the class itself. So uh, now we know that I'm taking the input number and storing it in the field. So we can do the same thing for the rest of these. Um, I don't have to say this dot diameter equals D um, because there's no ambiguity in the naming. I could just say diameter equals D if I wanted to. Either way works. X speed will be uh, XS and Y speed will be YS. Okay. So I've constructed uh, my ball and right now it doesn't have a color and that's fine. So that means that I can delete these because I'm already doing this. Instead of assigning the variables one at a time, I am constructing them all at the same time with the constructor. OK. So far, so good. So now we need to give it a behavior. Um, I think that let's leave, let's leave the ellipse command here because ellipse is a command of a drawing window. So I couldn't move this inside my ball object and still run the ellipse command because a ball object doesn't know what it means to say ellipse. Only a graphics window does. Um, but what I can do is uh, if my ball object is called ball, ellipse doesn't know what ball color is anymore. And it doesn't know, sorry, uh, the fountain class doesn't know what ball color is anymore. And it doesn't know what x and y are anymore. Because these are all variables that are inside ball now. So I can say oops, ball dot ball color. And now that's accessing the variable inside ball. Um, I should say at this point that um, this is a little bit unsafe, uh, just accessing this variable directly. It's probably all right for the small program we're doing now. It's more conventional to use what are called getter methods, which uh, are methods that return to you the variables that you're interested in looking at. Um, We'll, we'll get to that later. I'm not interested in doing that right now. Um, but you should be aware that this is, this is maybe not the best practice. All right, what about all this stuff down here? So this is, this is the two lines of code that move the ball. And this gives the ball an acceleration. And this tests to see if it should bounce off the bottom of the screen. So I'm going to cut all that. And I'm going to put it inside a method called move. So I want to be able to do this. I want to say draw the ball and then tell the ball to move itself however it needs to move. Um, this is highlighting in red right now because we don't actually have a move method. But if I go into ball, I could say public void move. And now I can paste all that code inside the move method. And it's doing the exact same things that it was when it was located in the fountain class, only now uh, these commands only occur when I tell the ball to move using the move method. So if I run it now, I see that the only thing that's changed is the color of the ball is now gone. Uh, I guess let's fix that. So here I can say ball dot, uh, ball color equals 
and then I can create whatever my color was. I think it was this. Cool. And now we've still got it. All right, here's what's convenient about this. Um, I can create more than one ball object very easily. I can create a ball two. And I can just copy and paste these things, except I can change the x-coordinate a little bit. And I'll change the y-coordinate a little bit. And maybe I'll change the color. And I'll do these same things, except instead of with ball one, it will all be with ball two. So now I'm telling ball one to draw itself and move itself, and now I'm telling ball two to draw itself and move itself. And as you can see, oh, it, we got a null pointer exception. What has gone wrong? Oh, because uh, when I copied and pasted up here, I'm creating the new ball object, but I'm storing it back into the ball variable. I need it to be in the ball two variable. Okay, as you can see, now there are two ball objects, and they are both bouncing. That's pretty mesmerizing. All right, well, I see I'm at 16 minutes already, so uh, tune in for the next video to see how we can use an array list to create a whole list of ball objects that we can loop through um, one at a time and, and do this for.